Hello, I'm Everett Rogers at the University of Michigan, and I want to talk with you today about diffusion research, where it's at, where it's going, and perhaps to some extent where we think it should go. To begin with, I want to tell you about what we mean by the diffusion of innovations. We think that there are four main elements in the diffusion of innovations. One of them is the innovation. We define an innovation to mean an idea perceived as new by the individual, by the receiver, by the person who learns about the new idea. A second element in any diffusion event are communication channels, channels by which the innovation spreads to the receivers. A third element, over time, you notice the S-shaped curve, a curve, you'll see many of these curves today, in fact, and in all of them, time is the dimension across this abscissa. And on this side, the number of adopters, or the rate of adoption. S-curves, the symbol of the whole field of diffusion, and emphasizing for us the importance of the time element in the diffusion of innovations. Our fourth element is in a social system. The system of receivers, receivers that are not all equal, as it turns out. Some of them are opinion leaders. The structure, the norms of the social system, uh, will have much to say about the rate at which an innovation diffuses. So these four main elements in the diffusion of an innovation. And for a, in any diffusion event that we'll talk about today, there are at least those four elements. So that's what the diffusion of innovations is all about. Now, the research that scholars have done on the diffusion of innovations is, in my opinion, a smaller subfield of, uh, of a larger circle uh, that is communication research. That is to say, there are kinds of communication research that are not the diffusion of innovations. They're out here. Uh, and the area that I've represented within this circle is diffusion research. Now the question, what is it exactly that makes the boundary? What is it that sets diffusion research off from these other kinds of communication research? Several things. First, in the case of diffusion research, the messages are new. And in the case of other kinds of communication research, other than diffusion research, the messages may be repeated messages, may be old messages, may be accustomed messages, may be expected messages, may be anticipated messages, but they're not new. And it is the newness of the innovation, the newness of the idea, the newness of the message, that is what makes diffusion distinctive. That is what makes the human behavior that results different than in other kinds of communication research. The first time that you heard about a new idea, if it was an important one to you, certainly it had a greater degree of risk associated with it than an old idea. A second distinctive aspect of the diffusion of innovations is that almost always, in the case of diffusion, there is a rather large degree of difference between the source and the receiver. Most of us, when we think about who we have communicated with in the last day, I would predict that most of the people that you have talked with in the last day have been people very much like yourself, people of similar education, in similar occupations, probably with similar styles of life, certainly with similar styles of thinking, a high degree of homophily or similarity, very frequent, birds of a feather, just like communicators do band together. However, in the case of diffusion, if only similar people communicated innovations, there would be no diffusion. That is to say, the source must be more expert, must be no, more knowledgeable about the innovation, or there would be no innovation to diffuse. Uh, one of the reasons that so many diffusion efforts fail is because of the heterophily, the dissimilarity between the source and the receiver in the case of diffusion. The more unalike two people are, the more difficult it is for them to communicate. And as I have tried to say, in the case of diffusion, there must be 
some degree of heterophily or unalikeness between the source and the receiver. So these are the two aspects that set diffusion research off from the broader field of communication research. And those two aspects are the newness of the message and secondly, the accompanying heterophily between source and receiver that almost always occurs in the case of diffusion. Now let's look at the historical ancestry of the field of diffusion research. It began, as we know, with studies by two rural sociologists named Ryan and Gross, who studied the diffusion of hybrid seed corn among Iowa farmers. That study was done about 30 years ago. Uh, it remains today as one of the great studies in the field of diffusion. And it was immediately followed by a great growth in the number of diffusion studies that were done by sociologists who were studying the diffusion of agricultural innovations. Within a few years, however, by the 1950s, uh, many other scholars were being attracted to the study of the diffusion of innovations. Uh, scholars in the field of marketing were studying the way in which new products spread. Uh, in education, Paul Mort and Richard Carlson and other scholars were studying the way in which new educational ideas spread uh, among schools. Uh, anthropologists were studying the diffusion of items such as the steel axe among the Yuri Arant, an Iberogeny tribe in Australia. <clears throat> in the field of mass communication, uh, scholars were studying, since the days of Deutschmann and Danielson, the spread of news events like a presidential assassination the statehood of a new state. Uh, major news events, Sputnik, as those events carried by mass channels and by interpersonal channels spread through a mass audience. In the field of medical sociology, well, I could go on and on, and I won't, other than to say that in the early days of diffusion research, there were many separate invisible colleges. That is, integrated little bodies of scholars studying the diffusion of a similar kind of innovation. But in 1962, at the time that I wrote a book called The Diffusion of Innovations, it was my opinion that each of these different invisible colleges that were studying the diffusion of innovations were all studying basically the same process. They were all finding S-shaped growth curves. They were finding a great number of other common results. And my whole, the theme, the editorial of my book was that they should recognize this basic similarity and learn from each other. In the years since 1962 until the present, at the present time, today, we do have, I feel, one invisible college of diffusion scholars. This includes individuals who may have disciplinary affiliations in a number of different fields, and the size and the numbers of scholars in each of these fields changes, some wax, some wane, but nevertheless, there is a high degree of integration of this invisible college. Whether these scholars are located at one university or another, in one kind of department or another, they have a similar point of view with some minor differences. It is an integrated invisible college today. Furthermore, the boundary around this invisible college is becoming a wall with more gates, uh, a wall less high. Uh, the intellectual exchange between the field of diffusion research and other related fields, such as attitude change, such as um, uh, other concerns with uh, human behavioral change, there's a greater exchange of concepts and viewpoints and methods across the boundary of the field of the Invisible College of Diffusion Research. Now let's begin to take a look at some of the main findings uh, in the field of diffusion and some of the recent developments regarding some of these customary findings, and some weaknesses in our present studies, and in fact, where they may want to go, or perhaps our field should go in the future. Earlier, we had mentioned the S-shaped uh, growth curve, uh, the curve of adoption, in which we have time across one dimension and the number of adopters across the other. In this chart, I have shown three different curves for three different educational innovations. And I want to use this as an illustration, as an example, uh, of many other kinds of data that have been um, uh, found in diffusion research. 
the first innovation that started to spread in about 1910 and reached almost complete use in U.S. public schools about 50 years later are kindergartens. The second innovation, driver training, took about 18 years to go from its beginnings in the early 30s until its widespread use. More recently, in the late 50s and early 60s, modern math only required about five years to reach its widespread use. We see in this illustration how the rate of adoption has increasingly become steeper. That is to say, how diffusion has become faster, speeded up. This, a commentary on the rate of change in American society today, and a common finding in many other countries in a particular field, whether education or industry, uh, medicine, an increasing rate of diffusion as time goes on. We also see in this S-curve, or in any one of these S-curves, uh, the first individuals to adopt, who we often call innovators, uh, in this left-hand tail of the curve, when they adopt, the curve does not begin to steepen very quickly. In fact, an inflection point occurs about here at which the rate of increase in the diffusion curve begins to increase. That, is, that happens at about this point when the curve really begins to take off, and it occurs because it is at that point that the opinion leaders, I'll have more to, about, I'll have more to say about them in a minute, when they adopt, that is what crystallizes a rapid rate of adoption in a system, a more rapid rate of adoption in a system, which then finally levels off as only a few individuals remain to adopt, uh, the so-called laggards or late adopters uh, in this region of the curve. Now, prior to the rise of diffusion research, we had a predominant viewpoint, uh, a mental conception, a model, of the effects of mass communication. And for simplicity's sake, I'm going to call that model the hypodermic needle model because our mental conception of how mass media effects occurred was largely as if the mass media were a giant hypodermic needle pecking and plunging at a passive audience, as Elihu Katz has said. Our, our idea prior to 1940 was that the mass media directly injected virulent messages in individual members of the mass audience. And the mass was seen as an atomized set of separate individuals without contacts among them. In 1940, a study of the 1940 presidential election by Paul Lazarsfeld uh, headed us in an entirely different direction in the field of mass communication. He coined, Lazarsfeld coined, the hypothesis of a two step flow model of communication. That is to say, the mass media were found in his study to have their effects largely through opinion leaders. The message was then first transmitted in a first step via the mass media, then in a second step by the opinion leaders via their interpersonal and social relationships to the mass audience, where the mass media had an indirect effect. In fact, that the main effect of the mass media was indirectly through the opinion leaders. Now, Lazarsfeld's conception was a very fruitful one for its time. It has been called uh, the most significant idea in the field of mass communication in the last 25 years. The only problem was it was a very difficult hypothesis to test, as later events have shown. Diffusion research, with its special ability to trace the spread of an innovation in a kind of tracer study through a population, through a system, gave us a means to actually gain better insight into the two-step flow model. The data that I have used here for my example come from a study by Richard O. Carlson at the University of Oregon in which he studied the spread of modern math among the school superintendents, all of the school superintendents, heading the schools in Allegheny County, Pennsylvania, the county in which Pittsburgh is located. As you can see, in 1958, one of these superintendents adopted. No one followed him. He ha we have shown with arrows and lines who each superintendent influenced regarding modern math. Uh, Mr. I out here uh, influenced no one else. Next, in 1959 and 1960, 
six key superintendents, all members of a friendship clique. They played golf together in the summer, poker in the winter. Uh, and while they played, of course, they talked, as we all do. There were three opinion leaders among these six, three individuals that were especially respected in the eyes of the other school superintendents in this system. And once those three opinion leaders adopted, then many others followed rather quickly. I have not shown all of the data for the later years of the diffusion of modern math in, in Allegheny County because it would become noise for our system. But in any event, one begins to see the significance of who the opinion leader is and that when the opinion leaders adopt, that the number of acceptors begins to shoot upward, as I've said. Now, if those opinion leaders are opposed to an innovation, naturally, uh, the S-shaped curve never takes off. But as a rule of thumb, we have often said that once the first 15 or 20 percent of the members of a system adopt an innovation, that is, once the opinion leaders approve of our innovation and use it, after that, it would be impossible to halt its further spread. There are some innovations uh, in which various in authority have tried to de-diffuse or to slow down the diffusion or prevent the diffusion. A recent example in the U.S. is the attempt by federal government to prevent the diffusion of so-called drug-like substances among our population, a rather unsuccessful attempt at de-diffusion. We also see more recently an attempt by a national governmental leader to prevent news of an international scandal from an, a national governmental scandal from spreading to his citizens. That too, an ultimately unsuccessful attempt at de-diffusion. So it's hard to keep diffusion from happening, although in some cases it is possible to halt its spread. Within the last three years, diffusion scholars have come to focus some attention on what has previously been considered an anomaly, an exception to the general case of diffusion. As I have said, most, most innovations follow an S-shaped curve, but some don't. Some spread very slowly and with only a long straight line. We have come to realize that one of the characteristics of these innovations that don't follow the S-curve, that never take off like a missile, is that they are taboo. By taboo, I mean that the innovation has certain qualities that make it extremely sensitive, that make it difficult or impossible to talk about freely. And in fact, because the innovation is taboo, there never is this binomial expansion in which each individual talks to two more individuals, who each talk to two more, and that makes that curve shoot up. Now, taboo innovations, and I could give you many examples of them, um, I think most of us would be hesitant to tell everyone very publicly that we have had an abortion or that our wife or our girlfriend has had an abortion. Uh, family planning is also a taboo topic. And in recent studies in Asia, we have come to see that one of the reasons why the rate of adoption of family planning innovations in countries such as India, one of the reasons that that diffusion has been so slow is traceable to the tabooness of the innovation. Now, it also suggests some strategies for us. If we want to make those taboo innovations spread more rapidly in an S-shaped curve, we need to move them on this continuum from taboo to non-taboo toward the right, toward this side. Now, how to do that? Easy to say, hard to do. I want to illustrate with some examples. Uh, one reason why taboo innovations do not spread more quickly is because they spread via interlocking networks. The innovation begins with one individual, spreads to friends who are friends of each other, but it never goes outside of the clique. It never breaks outside of the interlocking network. A non-taboo innovation is more likely to spread among less homophilous, less alike people, and to spread outwardly. We call this a radial network. And it is this kind of innovation through radial networks that makes the S-shaped growth curve. Now some illustrations of strategies to convert taboo innovations 
to less taboo innovations. This is a street scene from New Delhi, India. This is the sign, the government sign, a road sign, for family planning. It says, Do Yatim Bachi Bas, two or three children, that's enough, stop. It shows a father, mother, and two happy children, the so-called smiling faces, and the symbol of family planning in India, the red triangle standing on its point. This symbol is used throughout India on nurses' caps, on packets of condoms, uh, on family planning clinics and vehicles, and wherever it is, everyone knows that is family planning. This symbol, because it is so abstract, Lal Tikon, has helped represent a taboo innovation in a way that is less taboo. In India, one of the most taboo innovations are condoms, which are called French letters or French leathers in India. Uh, a very taboo innovation, considered messy, uh, repulsive, something that only soldiers and policemen use with prostitutes, but not something that a man would use with his wife to prevent uh, unwanted births. Starting in 1968, the government of India launched a national campaign for knee road. Knee road being a new term that was given by communication research workers to condoms or French letters in India. By renaming the innovation, knee road, a Sanskritic word that means protection, pleasant protection, government of India was able to make uh, condoms a much less taboo topic. And last year, six million condoms, six million Indian couples uh, prevented conception, unwanted conception with, with knee road. A similar idea in Kenya. Uh, kinga is the Swahili word for protection, a new word coined a couple of years ago for government uh, condoms distributed through a commercial uh, company in Kenya uh, using a symbol of a Maasai-like warrior with his shield to symbolize um, this otherwise taboo innovation and a rate of adoption that since has been reassuring. Naturally, the Swedes uh, take it all when it comes to their ability to turn a taboo innovation into a humorous non-taboo topic. This is the so-called smiling penis of Sweden used by the Swedish Association for Sex Education to promote their blackjack condom. Uh, this ad was carried in a national news magazine in Sweden and the use of humor and the flowers and love motif are used to break down the otherwise taboo nature of condoms as a family planning method in Sweden. So if you're st in Stockholm, look for the signs and symbols and ads of the famous smiling penis. Now we come to the issue that has been called by communication scholars the strength of weak ties. What we mean by this concept is that frequently an innovation enters a group of similar individuals, an interlocking network, uh, who are very homophilous or like each other, the innovation spreads rapidly among the members, then slowly and through a weak tie that I've indicated by a dotted line to another group of homophilous others in an interlocking clique, then via a liaison, a bridge person, and again a dotted line, a weak tie, into another group. Studies have been done of the diffusion of family planning innovations, uh, of the spread of job information uh, that show that we have alternately a weak tie between unalike individuals then close ties among similar individuals in, the, in a pattern of diffusion. The term, the strength of weak ties, indicates the informational strength of weak interpersonal ties that bind the cliques together. It is through this kind of research in Asia, this study was done in the Philippines, and in other countries that make us increasingly aware of the importance of using network analysis studies of inter interpersonal communication relationships to accurately understand or gain greater understanding of the two-stepped or three-stepped or multi-stepped flow process by which innovations spread through the members of a social system. Another recent uh, 